Kirk, what do you think about nuclear-powered rockets? About what? Nuclear-powered rockets. I actually think they're a really dumb idea. And I came to that position reluctantly, but the, uh, the numbers led me there. I'd be happy to go through a derivation of that, Gord. I got lots of slides on that. Well, I'm hoping to get you in a position where you can pretty much talk about anything you feel like. <laughs> nuclear, power, nuclear thermal propulsion may be the biggest waste of fissile material anybody has ever come up with in the history of nuclear use. As far as like, how much of the potential energy did you get out of a group of fissile material by the time you were done? So you're okay, you wanna use a mouse to navigate these slides? Yeah, I've been doing that. Okay. Okay, Kirk, so this is the primary camera right here. How do you want to start? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm good. We're recording. Maybe uh, clap your hands three times. That's always a good way to start, wouldn't you say? Yeah. The basic reason we're interested in nuclear power as an energy source is because it represents an energy density far in excess of chemical energy. And the reason for this has to do with the structure of matter itself. When we are using chemical energy in the form of combustion, digestion, uh, photosynthesis, we're talking about changing the energy states of the electrons around the nucleus of the atom. And they are bound by forces that are measured in a unit called the electron volt. It's a, it's a unit of energy. When we're talking about the forces of nuclear energy, whether it be nuclear fission, nuclear fusion, or nuclear decay, we're talking about releasing the energies that bind the nucleus of the atom. And the nucleus of the atom is bound by energies measured in millions of electron volts. And so by accessing nuclear energy, we're accessing an energy source that is literally millions of times more energy dense than chemical energy. And this is also significant because there's really no in-between between chemical energy and nuclear energy. There's no nuclear, there's no atomic structure other than the electrons in the nucleus. There's nothing in there that is bound at thousands of times the, the binding energy of chemical energy or something like that. It really is a change from going from chemical energies to nuclear energies, and it's a huge step. This is also one of the reasons that we've been able to get away with using nuclear energy as inefficiently as we do today, because when you're dealing with an energy source that's a million times more energy dense, even if you're using it at one one hundredth its efficiency, you're still doing thousands of times better than chemical energy. And that's really the state we're in right now with the way we use uranium. But the potential to go to high efficiency nuclear, as represented by thorium in the liquid fluoride reactor, would allow us to access millions of times the energy density of chemical energy. Mr. Mr. Not Moving Much is pretty good for putting the, cam the light behind you. Oh, no, no, oh, not the... Not the Star Trek shot. <coughs> camera flash, camera flash. <laughs> I really like this Star Trek reboot. Well, in the old 60s Star Trek, anytime they would show a... Anytime they would show a girl, and especially when they wanted to make her like, seem really beautiful, they would always have this music they'd play and they'd always backlight her right from behind so that it made the edge of her hair seem to glow. Do you ever remember that Star Trek episode had Joan Collins in it? No, she's older than I am. It was one of the most famous, uh, it was one of the most famous Star Trek episodes. It's consistently voted their favorite. It's called The City on the Edge of Forever. Oh, I remember that. Episode. And in the episode, Captain Kirk and, and, and Bones and yeah. Spock go back in time through this time portal on a distant planet and they arrive on Earth in like 1938. And Joan Collins plays this community organizer type person who is, uh, she's actually a pacifist and they find out that he saves her life right as they get there and they find they've disrupted time by delaying the United States' entry into World War II, causing the Nazis to take over the world. And so they have to undo this act of charity by allowing her to be killed later. And Captain Kirk falls in love with her, but she has this great monologue in the, in, the, in the show that is still one of the most repeated scenes where she says, someday men will access energies and they will use it to propel ships into the great unknown and we will see worlds and things that we can only imagine. And she goes, and those will be the days worth living for. And you're like, yes, <laughs> such a great scene. Yeah. Okay, do I need to clap? Nope, you're good. 
The notion of the chain reaction is one of the basic principles in nuclear fission. And, and this idea was first conceived by a Leo Slizard in the early 1930s. He was, he was crossing the street one day and he had the idea of one event causing two events and two events causing four events and so on. And, and he really had no idea how this would take place. But when he first heard about the experiments on nuclear fission that were being done by Otto Hahn and, and Fritz Strassmann in 1938, he knew uh, the question to ask, which was, were more, than one elect were, were more than one neutron being emitted per fission event? And once he realized that it was substantially more than one neutron, he realized the chain reaction would be possible and that both nuclear weapons and that nuclear power would also be possible. The idea is that a neutron will strike a fissile nucleus, and a fissile nucleus is is either uranium-235, plutonium-239, or uranium-233, and will cause it to fission into two pieces, two fission products, and will also emit uh, two or three neutrons. These neutrons will then go on to cause other fission events, uh, two becoming four, becoming eight, and so on, increasing exponentially. Now, I also think that this uh, notion of a chain reaction has, has uh, perhaps been used a number of times to uh, perhaps scare people about how nuclear fission reactions really take place in a reactor as if they are an uncontrolled expansion of the, fission, of the number of fission events. That's not really what happens in a reactor because you reach a point where only one fission is causing another fission and that is the notion of criticality. It's a state of balance, of neutronic balance. Uh, but early in the startup of a nuclear reactor, uh, you have supercriticality, which is where one fission is causing more than one fission. That's how a reactor increases its power. Uh, it is supercritical when it is increasing its power, and it's subcritical when it is decreasing its power. So there are stages in the startup of a reactor where it is supercritical, not uh, one becoming two, becoming four, et cetera, but, but uh, this notion is, is still relevant. Where you do see supercriticality as, as manifested in something like this picture would be in the, in the detonation of a nuclear weapon, where there is a very, very fast multiplication of the number of neutrons going on uh, to enable this reaction to take place in a very short period of time. Obviously, that's not what we want to do in reactors, and most reactors are completely incapable of sustaining that kind of neutron multiplication, but it is nevertheless something that takes place in a weapon. Um, is supercriticality past, uh, possible past one electron, electron um, or sorry, one neutron triggering two neutrons? I mean, that's the complete map. That's the theoretical maximum of supercriticality? No, supercriticality is, is possible almost at any, at any neutron multiplication. You know, one can cause three, well, one can cause four, depending on whatever the neutron multiplying medium is. Uh, but typically, supercriticality in a, in a nuclear reactor is a very, very low number, a number very, very close to one. It would be like 1.0000 something. And that would be a, a supercritical state in a reactor where something like 10,000 neutrons would be causing 10,001 new neutrons to be formed through fission. The notion of nuclear criticality, I think, is something that a lot of people don't understand. And, and because of this, they might fear it. It really isn't something to be feared. Nuclear criticality is, is, a, is a situation of balance, a balance between how many nuclear reactions are taking place at a given time and how many will take place in the next generation of reactions. And Nuclear criticality also doesn't have anything to do with the number of reactions that are taking place. One neutron causing a fission, causing the formation of another neutron, causing another fission, is a situation of criticality. So, as my professor would often tell me in, in nuclear engineering school, you can be critical on one neutron, and that is a valid statement of criticality. Now, if you had one neutron causing one fission, it would be utterly indetectable. It would be so insignificant. It would be uh, a billionth of a billionth of the flap of a, of a fly's wing. It would be just utterly no energy at all. But nevertheless, it would be a situation of criticality. In a real operating reactor that is operating at a, at a significant power level, there are uh, about a billion, billion fission reactions going on at any given moment. And so those reactors also are operating in a state of criticality, but they're not changing power, they're maintaining power. So you're getting a billion billion fissions and the next generation is a billion billion fissions. Now, if a generation of fissions is causing a billion billion plus one fissions, 
then that is a state of supercriticality. That's where you're increasing power and, and the next generation would be a billion, billion plus two fissions and so on and so forth where you would actually be going up in power. On the other hand, if you have a situation you're getting a billion, billion minus one fissions, then you're going down in power, that subcriticality, and your reactor is shutting down. Both subcriticality and supercriticality are normal operating states in a reactor. A reactor has to attain a degree of supercriticality to increase power, and it has to attain subcriticality to reduce power. So these are not strange situations. At criticality, it is staying flat on power. So when you want to bring a reactor up to power, you bring it to supercriticality to a certain level. You go up till you get to where you want to be, and then you level out at criticality. And one of the things I had wondered about for the longest time was it seems like this is such a precise balance. How would it be possible in an engineered machine to attain such an absolute perfect situation of balance where you weren't leading to more or less fissions, but you could actually hold at exactly 1.0000, you know, 10 zeros beyond that, that state of criticality. And what I found to my great interest was the reactor will do it for you if you design it properly. Kirk, what does that entail, designing the reactor properly? Okay, that's the next slide. In the design of a reactor, it's very important to incorporate design features that make the reactor self-controlling. And it turns out that this is not nearly as hard to do as you might think. Uh, when you want to have a reactor running at a, at a constant power, at a state of criticality, it's important that every generation of fissions leads to the same number of fissions in the next generation, not more, not less. And a physical analogy we might use to this might be the idea of a mass on a spring. If you have a mass hanging on a spring, uh, it will go down a certain distance until the force on the spring is holding it up at the same amount of the, the, the gravitational pull of the earth pulling the mass down. If you were to pull the mass down and release it, it would go back up because the force of the spring would return it back to what's called its equilibrium configuration. On the other hand, if you push the mass up, relieving some of the tension on the spring, then it will fall down and again oscillate and bounce because the spring uh, has to restore it back to its so-called equilibrium position. That's a good analogy for how things are taking place in a reactor. A reactor wants to operate at a particular uh, power generation setting. If you increase the demand on the reactor, if you want to make it move to a new power setting, then it will tend to tune right in to that power demand. On the other hand, if you reduce the power required of the reactor, again, it will tend to tune right down to those new power settings. Now, how is this possible? How can a reactor know what it is that you want of it? Well, it has to do with a feature called the negative temperature coefficient of reactivity. And that's a very long phrase to describe a rather simple idea. The idea being that the reactor will become more reactive as it gets cooler and less reactive as it gets hotter. And so the manifestation of that in operation is if you were to increase the demand on power for a reactor, the coolant water would return to the reactor cooler than had been the state before. That cooler water would uh, be able to moderate more neutrons in a given volume and the reactor power rate would increase. On the other hand, if you reduce the power demand to the gas, to the steam turbine, the cooling water would come back hotter, which would lead to a larger amount of uh, less water per unit volume and it's less able to moderate the neutrons and so you have a reduction in power. And so in a water-cooled reactor, a lot of the inherent stability of the reactor has to do with the temperature of the water. The temperature of the water is the sense or is the, uh, is the communication to the reactor as far as what is the demand on the reactor. In a liquid fluoride reactor, uh, the mechanism is analogous, a little different though. Instead of, we don't use water in our reactor, we use this liquid salt, but as the liquid salt returns back to the core cooler than might be expected for the previous operating level, as it's cooler, it's more dense, it's more likely to have fissions, and so the fission rate increases and you generate more power, which is, which is uh, the response to uh, a cooler return of salt, which would come from greater power demand from the power conversion system. Conversely, if the demand goes down on the power conversion system, the salt returns hotter, it's less likely to fission, the reactivity goes down, and the, power, and the reactor power goes down. So in both cases, the water-cooled reactor and the salt reactor, the reactors are automatically responding to situations 
uh, on the grid that they're feeling through the power conversion system. And that can come from the generator generating electricity, it's on the grid. It could come from a shaft that was on a ship making shaft power or propeller. Any of these situations communicate uh, the demand back to the reactor. And through the negative temperature coefficient, the reactor naturally goes through a period of either supercriticality or subcriticality returning to a critical state. And this can all be done without human intervention. It's, it's, it's very natural, it's very in the system. It's, it's, it's the way the reactor naturally wants to respond to a displacement condition, analogous to the displacement of the mass on the spring. How come uh, I always hear nuclear power is base load energy? It, it sounds like you're describing something more dynamic than how I've de heard nuclear power described before. Nuclear power is base load energy, and there's a number of reasons why utilities like to operate nuclear power in a constant power state. Uh, one of them has to do with, in water-cooled reactors, boron is used as a chemical shimming agent. It's designed to change the reactivity of the of the coolant water. And so to load follow, uh, they will either add or remove boron from the water. When it is removed, it's removed through some resin beds. And uh, those resin beds then have to be disposed of as low level waste. So there's a bit of a financial incentive to uh, not use the water cooled reactors as a load following reactor, but rather to use them as a base load. But they are perfectly capable of following a dynamic load if so desired. Uh, through the expenditure of just some, uh, just some resin to both to remove boron from the water or alternatively the operator would inject boron in the water as needed. In the liquid fluoride reactor, uh, those principles aren't needed because of the particular response characteristics of the reactor. It would be, uh, uh, the penalty towards load following would be much less. But both reactors are capable of load following. Um, Kirk, with the uh, I thought that with the, the lifter reactors, um, as the if the if the core the reactor core gets too hot, like too many um, too many fissions are happening, then the salt will expand and push that material out of the reactive zone. Um, how does like how does that um, like equi like equi um, balancing mechanism uh, couple with the, the temperature changes you were discussing with being pulled out for electricity generation. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I guess you could say the, the zone of, of reactive salt that's moving through the core at any given time, I mean, you've got a volume of, of reactive, vol there's a volume where salt is reacting. As the salt is hotter, there's less salt in that same volume. As the salt is cooler, there's more salt in that same volume. So, in a sense, pushing out, you know, this isn't static salt, this is moving salt, but you could imagine uh, a hotter slug of salt coming into the core is to some sense displacing uh, more volume than the previous slug of cold salt. Okay. So it, it isn't a, a static process, it is dynamic, it's always moving, but, but the, the expansion and contraction of the salt is a very, very strong manifestation of the negative temperature coefficient of reactivity. Hey Kirk, do you want to um, set the stage here before we move on? In case we forget to do it later, just to say we're here to um, educate Cameron and you. You know, wh what's Cameron here doing here, and why are we doing it with Cameron? Well, we're here to uh, educate Cameron. No, not really. We're here to make a movie. <laughs> One of the things that's been great about Gord's work with Thorium Remix 2011 is how much education takes place in that video kind of inadvertently. People are learning principles of, of nuclear physics and nuclear reactor theory just by watching the movie. Now, when we did it before, I don't think we were really meaning to do that. We, we, a lot of it came out of a lecture I gave in the basement of a, of a protospace office in, in Calgary, and, and it really wasn't uh, intended. This is an attempt, I think, to do it a little more formally, uh, a little more uh, be better production value, shall we say. All right, cool. When a nuclear fission takes place, two fission products are formed and they have different masses. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. As the neutron goes in to the nucleus, the nucleus begins to distend and a piece comes off. And it doesn't wait until the two pieces are exactly the same size before it separates. It's, it can either be too small or else it won't come off. Or if it's too big, it, or it approaches 50%, it won't come off either. So there's always about a point where it's, it's ready to separate. And it generally comes when the smaller piece is about 30 or 40% the size of the larger piece. I'm sorry, 30 or 40% the, uh, the size of the original mass. And so what this leads to is... Say that before you move on. Pardon me? Take that sentence from the top again. Uh, there's a point where the smaller 
fission product is about 30 or 40 percent the original mass of the nucleus when it separates. And the larger fission product is basically what was left over when the smaller fission product separates. And so what this leads to is it leads to a, a double humped distribution in the masses of the fission products. Uh, the first hump is the, is the smaller fission product and the second hump is the larger fission product. And this is, this is if you plot the propensity to get the fission products by their masses. If you plot by mass, as you see in this slide, you'll see that double hump distribution. And that's why you get it. That's the physical reason why there is a double hump distribution, why there is a smaller fission product and a larger one. For the longest time, I thought, well, why don't they just come off? Why, why isn't it basically split in two? You think about it, it's going to hit, it's going to break it in half. That's not really how it works. It hits it, and it sets up a, a kind of coming apart where the smaller one comes apart from the larger one. And this was one of the great realizations that was made by the, the physicist Lise Meitner, who was a, a refugee from Nazi Germany, when she had received uh, a letter from her friend Otto Hahn, where he was saying that he was seeing very, very lightweight elements from his bombardment of uranium. He was seeing barium, and he thought, well, I shouldn't be seeing barium because it's about, you know, 60% the mass of uranium. Why am I seeing that? She first conceived the idea that okay, perhaps the nucleus is, is coming apart. Perhaps it's breaking into two smaller pieces. She was right, and she was the first person to, to make that very, very large mental leap to conceive of the idea of nuclear fission. Uh, so the, the separation of these two fission products, they both end up very, very radioactive. And there's a simple reason why that is. Uh, every nucleus has a balance of protons and neutrons that gives it the stability that it has. And when you have small nuclei like you know, carbon or oxygen, those protons and neutrons are roughly in the same number. Uh, eight protons for oxygen, 16, eight neutrons. But as the nuclei get larger and larger, uh, they have more and more neutrons. And they have more neutrons than they do protons. There's a simple reason for that, too. The protons are continually trying to pull the nucleus apart because they all have the same charge. So the electromagnetic force is, is trying to pull them apart, but the strong nuclear force is holding them together. Now, the neutrons, they don't have an electric charge but they do have the strong nuclear force. So they're acting almost like glue. They're adding more of that strong nuclear force glue to the nucleus, but they're not adding more electromagnetic repulsion trying to pull the nucleus apart. So that is the simple reason why, as you look at heavier and heavier elements, you see that there's more and more neutrons than there are protons. For very heavy elements like thorium and uranium, there are significantly more neutrons than protons. And so when you split those elements, when you split those nuclei, the two products inherit that same ratio of neutron-proton balance. The problem is, it's the wrong number for where they will be in their atomic mass, as shown by the, the graph on the left. They don't need a ratio that high. They need a ratio lower for stability. And so what nature needs to do is it needs to change the neutron-proton balance for the new daughter products versus the original parent material. And this is done through a simple process called beta radiation. Uh, in these nuclei, neutrons are converting into protons. And by converting to protons, every time they do that, they're changing that ratio, that balance between the neutrons and protons, making the nuclei more proton rich, less neutron rich. And every time a neutron changes into a proton, it emits an electron, a high energy electron, sometimes called a beta ray. This is the basis of beta radiation. And after uh, four or five beta radiations, a uh, new fission product will typically have achieved stability. This happens fairly quickly in most fission products, surprisingly quickly. That's why fission products are intensely radioactive when they form, but they stabilize relatively quickly thereafter. Oh, wait, yeah, I do have a question. So you said that beta decay is the primary mechanism by which the fission products um, to like, uh, like regain re the right balance. Um, does alpha decay play into this at all? No, because alpha fission products don't alpha decay. Okay. If you have a slide that shows the decay chart, we're going we're to get to a slide in that. It'd be interesting to show that you can tell whether these were developed by an accelerator or by fission. Yeah, fission always approaches from the neutron-rich side, so there's a number of things about. We'll, we'll talk this, and we're kind of talking these discreetly, so we may have some slides in here. All right. All right. This is the periodic table with some of the sections highlighted in different colors, and what I've done on this table is you see the masses that you typically find on the smaller fission product highlighted in yellow, and then the masses that you typically find on the heavier fission product highlighted in green. And so for the yellow, uh, the lighter fission products, they start at about selenium, and they peak, uh, I believe, around uh, zirconium, and then they start going down again. So it's a distribution, there's a peak, and it starts going down again. 
until there's very, very few. Uh, the boundary between the two is not a hard boundary. It's, it's a little bit arbitrary between indium of tin. And then you start peaking again on the other side around xenon and then falling off again. But you do pick up a number of the lanthanides like neodymium is a very significant fission product. But by the time you've got to dysprosium, like there's very, very little dysprosium in, in, uh, in the fission products of a, of a nuclear reaction. And then there's this gap for a while where, where there are things that simply are not made by fission. Uh, the heavier lanthanides, uh, tungsten, gold, mercury, none of, those, none of those are made by fission. And then when you get to thallium, uh, lead, and bismuth, you're getting to the tail end of what heavy actinides decay into. Now you're getting to what's called the decay products. These are not formed by fission. They're formed when you leave uranium and thorium and plutonium alone for you know, hundreds or thousands of years, they will decay into these products. And those are shown in this chart in uh, a pink color. And then ultimately you get to thorium element 90 and uranium element 92. Those are the two parent materials for all of the decay products. That's what everything that's going to form naturally by radioactive decay, that's where it comes from originally. Uh, we don't have any you know, natural neptunium or plutonium on the earth that was all been made by, by people making it in nuclear reactors. The natural materials we have are thorium and uranium. They produce these decay products. And through fission, they produce uh, the elements that are shown in the yellow and the green. So you get a lot of different things from fission, but you don't get everything, and that's significant. It's not as if you're dumping the whole periodic table out when you, when you make fission. You get certain elements in, in a preponderance, and, and you get some very rarely, and you get some not at all, for instance. You can't make gold from fission. It just doesn't happen. You make very little silver, and you don't make any copper. So, so it's not a good word to end the sentence on. <laughs> the chart you see here is a slightly different depiction of the results of fission. Uh, again, you see what looks like a, a two-part distribution, but this time, instead of being graphed in terms of their abundance by atomic mass, which incorporates both the protons and the neutrons, they are graphed by atomic number, which is just the protons. And the significance of graphing them just by atomic number is you can see what elements they actually are. Because the atomic number, which is the number of protons in the nucleus, is what gives an element its, its identity. For instance, if you have a nucleus that has 40 protons in it, that element is zirconium. It's nothing else. If it has 41, it's something else. If it has 39, it's something else. So by plotting according to atomic number, we really see what's in the fission products. And in this case, looking at the graph, you can see element 40, which is zirconium, is the most common of the lighter side of the fission product distribution. And element 42, which is molybdenum, is also rather common. Now there's a complete drop off in the middle there of element 41, which is niobium. And I had wondered for the longest time, why is that? Why is there no niobium of any significance in the fission products? It has to do with the particular way uh, elements decay or uh, isotopes decay when they have uh, a neutron richness that is inherited from their parent nuclei. And, and literally, niobium is shielded from formation. That's why there's extremely little niobium in fission products. On the heavier fission product distribution, we see a peak at element 54. That's xenon. So we can see that xenon is the most common of the fission products. And the second most common is the peak at element 60, that's neodymium. Neodymium is used in small, lightweight, uh, rare earth magnets. So ranking the fission products in order of their prevalence, we would see that xenon is the most common, and neodymium is the second most common, then followed by zirconium and molybdenum. And that really rounds out the, the top four most common fission products. You know, I've never seen this chart. I had to make this chart. And it's funny, in all these nuclear books I had, I'd never seen the fission products distributed by atomic number rather than by atomic mass. See, that's by atomic mass, that one right there. It does, it looks nice. And when you do it by mass, that's what you get. But when you do it by number, it's a little different. The second chart is the same data as presented in the previous chart, except now, instead of being graphed on the y-axis by an absolute number, it is graphed on the y-axis by a logarithmic value. And this enables you to see much smaller numbers easily. So each notch on the y-axis represents a power of 10. And again, the, the same four elements are at the top, but the differences have been muted significantly. And we can see that the, the neodymium is, or I'm sorry, not the neodymium, 
we can see that the niobium is at a much smaller value, but again, the, the double hump distribution is, is rather apparent. <laughs> so, let's go, let's go back. Let's do the, let's do the, let's do the hippie. That's fun. I think this is kind of a funny cartoon because it highlights something that uh, people sometimes in the nuclear community wonder is the, the fellow in here said, if only there was a source of reliable, oh, I can't read it. <laughs> Let me start over. Okay, here, I've got my glasses. I'll do my glasses on this one. I put this cartoon in because I think it's a little bit funny. It, it shows a, a, a green saying, if only there was a viable, reliable, alternative source of energy that is low in greenhouse gas emissions and plentiful. And in the background, you see a nuclear power plant. And, and although uh, many green people don't care for nuclear energy, what we think is that we share a lot of the same goals. We want a cleaner environment. We want a cleaner earth. And with lifter technology, we have the potential to make a form of nuclear energy that I think would be far less objectionable than the current water-cooled uranium-fueled nuclear reactors that we use today. With lifter technology, we have the potential to make a reactor that's far more efficient, uses a lot less fuel, has a lot less requirements for construction, has a much, much higher degree of inherent safety, and would be sustainable for many, many tens of thousands of years. So what's in spent nuclear fuel that we have today? Well, when we first load, spent nu when we first load nuclear fuel in a uranium-fueled reactor, it is, most, it is entirely uranium, and most of that is uranium-235. As it is exposed and, and, and burns down, so to speak, uh, you see first at a year, two years, and then three years, you see the formation of other things. These are the fission products, as well as some of the transuranics. Let me first talk about the fission products. These are the direct products of fission, the fission of the uranium-235. And the most common one is, is xenon and zirconium, molybdenum, neodymium. Those are, are right there near the top. You can also see the uranium-235, which is the, the bright green, uh, burns down over the, the space of three years in a reactor until the point when it's uh, less than 1% of the amount of uranium in the fuel. A uh, small amount of uranium-236 is formed. This is formed when uranium-235 gets struck by a neutron and doesn't fission, but rather absorbs that neutron. So uranium-236 goes from being essentially non-existent in the fresh fuel to being a, a non-trivial fraction in the, in the spent fuel. The uranium-238 also goes down because the uranium-238 will absorb neutrons and will form first plutonium-239. So you see it at a, at a year, plutonium is the predominant member of the transuranics. But as the reactor is continually exposed to more neutrons, some of that plutonium-239 burns and some of it absorbs a neutron and becomes plutonium-240 and then americium-241 and, and some of the higher actinides. This is the material that really drives a lot of the concern about the uh, disposition of spent nuclear fuel. It's not so much about the fission products. They're very radioactive, the fission products are, but they're also decaying very quickly. So they stabilize in a, in a relatively short period of time. Uh, most of them stabilize within the few, first few years. A few take about a decade. And then there are two, uh, strontium-90 and cesium-137 that have 30-year half-life. So they take about uh, two to 300 years to stabilize. There are a few other fission products that have very long half-lives, but they don't have a uh, high level of radioactivity precisely because they have such long half-lives and aren't a real big concern for long-term spent fuel disposition. But it is the transuranics, the plutonium, the americium, the curium, that drive concerns about the disposal of spent nuclear fuel. And so in a, typic, in a typical uh, rod of, of spent nuclear fuel, you'll see this composition where the uranium is burned down to a degree. Now, uh, it, the hatch at the bottom gives away the fact that most of the rod is still uranium-238. The overwhelming majority is still this unburned uranium-238. And that's why still most of that potential energy remains to be exploited. In fact, the only fraction that has been truly burned is the fraction you see kind of in those light pastel colors. The, those are the fission products. But the remainder of the material is, is still represents uh, uh, unrealized energy. 
Unfortunately, we can't realize all of that energy in uranium except in a fast reactor. It can't be exploited in a thermal reactor. And so this is really what's going on with our spent nuclear fuel now. We're ending up with three, or, or three, three main parts to it. The, the uranium that was there originally, the fission products, and then these transuranics. And in a reprocessing scenario, these could potentially be separated and, and new uranium could be formed from old uranium and transuranics could be consumed or, or used to generate electricity and the fission products could be partitioned and sold for useful materials. Could you say that last couple sentences because it didn't sound like you had a lot of energy as you ended it? That's, that is sound. You don't have a lot of energy because you want to go for rosies, don't you? No, I'm just trying to think. I was, my mind was getting mushy. Um, let's, go, well, let's go to the next slide. It's a little wordy. Do we want to talk through the individual fission products? I've got about 20 slides about the individual <laughs> fission products. How long would that take? Long time, probably. I mean, we could just do a minute on each one. Sure. Okay, then you could pick the one you wanted to talk about and you'd have a little more about it. Let's skip this one. Zirconium is one of the most common fission products and it consists of five natural isotopes uh, there are also two naturally radioactive isotopes in zirconium. Uh, zirconium-93 is one of the fission products that has a long half-life. And, and right now, zirconium is rather inexpensive. It's, it's used for the cladding of nuclear reactors. So there's a lot of zirconium in there in addition to the fission product zirconium. But it is unlikely that zirconium would be a fission product that we would be interested in recovering. Molybdenum is another common fission product and it is used in a variety of industrial processes. There are several, seven natural isotopes of molybdenum, and it, it not only fissions, but it stabilizes quickly, and so you reach a point where the, the molybdenum you have is not radioactive. Uh, molybdenum is, is fairly common. It doesn't have a particularly high value, and so using uh, recovered molybdenum from a reactor is, uh, would probably not be uh, particularly attractive financially, but it does represent another example of a fission product that stabilizes and could be recovered and extracted and potentially used, although it, it would depend on the cost of extraction, whether or not it would be worth using. Ruthenium is a very valuable rare earth, I'm sorry, <laughs> let me start over. Ruthenium is a very valuable platinum group metal. It has seven stable isotopes, and ruthenium could be recovered from spent nuclear fuel, potentially at, a, at an economic advantage. Uh, it has one isotope that has a half-life of about a year, so you have to age the ruthenium about a decade before it would be ready to be sold to people that did not want to worry about any residual radioactivity. But ruthenium is used in catalysts and I believe in, in some forms of jewelry. Rhodium is another platinum group metal that is formed in fission. At a, at, it's less common than ruthenium, but substantially more valuable. Its longest half-life isotope is uh, about 200 days, and so it would take an amount of time, um, six or seven years, to age rhodium appropriately before it would be ready to be used without worrying about radioactive contamination. But rhodium is used, again, in jewelry and also in uh, catalytic materials where they're trying to promote a, a chemical reaction. It, it represents one of the most valuable fission products that could potentially be extracted, although the requirement to age it might reduce its value and it would also depend on the cost of extraction. Xenon is the most common of all the fission products and, and represents a very interesting possibility because xenon is rather easy to extract from a liquid fluoride reactor. It simply comes off as bubbles. It's also very important to separate in a liquid fluoride reactor because xenon-135, which has a short half-life of nine hours, is the strongest of all the neutron absorbers. So there's a great incentive to want to remove xenon to improve the performance of the reactor. The remainder of the xenon stabilizes relatively quickly. Within about a month, it would be safe to use the xenon without worry of any radioactive contamination. And the reason for this is there's so many stable isotopes of xenon. That's why it is such a common fission product. NASA uses xenon as a, as a uh, material to throw out the backside of an ion engine. There's a spacecraft in the asteroid belt now called Dawn, which is using xenon ion engines uh, to propel itself extremely, efficiency, extremely efficiently. We used to joke at NASA that xenon was one of the few things that was worth launching into space because it actually cost about as much as it cost to put up in space. And so xenon could be recovered relatively easily from, uh, from, the, from the liquid fluoride thorium reactor. 
and potentially sold as a, as a commercial product once it, is, once it had stabilized. Xenon could actually be recovered from a liquid fluoride reactor and sold once it had stabilized. <coughs> neodymium is the second most common fission product, and neodymium is one of those unsung heroes of the elements. We, we probably don't think much about it, even though we use it each day. Neodymium is most commonly used in neodymium iron boron magnets, which are extremely powerful for their size. Uh, these small magnets have made things possible like miniature hard drives and also the earbud earphones that so many of us enjoy as we listen to music. Neodymium has seven stable isotopes. That's why it's the uh, second most common fission product because there's so many different places for each of those atomic masses to finally decay into. The longest lived uh, neodymium isotope is, has about an 11 day half-life. So after aging neodymium for about 100 days, it would be safe to use and it would no longer contain any significant levels of radioactivity. Could you mention that they're used in uh, wind turbines? In wind turbines, it's important to utilize motors that are very lightweight because they are on the top of this, uh, this engineered structure, the, the mast of the wind turbine. And so these uh, motor generators really have to try to minimize their weight as much as possible. One of the ways to minimize the weight of motor generators is to use permanent magnets like uh, neodymium iron boron. And so many of the wind turbine designs incorporate substantial amounts of neodymium in their construction. Uh, some estimates are as much as a ton of neodymium in each wind turbine. So ironically, they are turning into a, a real driver of the, of the market for new neodymium. You want to talk through any of the decay chains? Yeah. Let's just go to the next one, next one, there you go. You've seen this slide a bunch, Gord. Nature gave us three options for nuclear reactions. Only one of the materials in nature is naturally fissile, and that's uranium-235, which is a very small amount of natural uranium, about 0.7%. This was the first thing we ever figured out how to fission in 1938, when fission was discovered by Otto Hahn and identified by Lise Meitner. The second path to nuclear energy through fission was discovered shortly thereafter by Glenn Seaborg when he irradiated uranium-238 with neutrons and he formed a new element, plutonium, and particularly plutonium-239, an isotope that is also fissile. Uranium-235 and plutonium-239 were the focuses of the atomic research done under the Manhattan Project. In fact, the first nuclear weapon that was dropped on Hiroshima was based on uranium-235 and plutonium-239 was used in the first atomic test, the Trinity test, and also in the bomb at Nagasaki. The third option, which was based on thorium, was also discovered by Seaborg student in 1942 when thorium was irradiated with a neutron and, and a new isotope of uranium was formed, uranium-233. Uranium-233 isn't present naturally but has particularly appealing attributes as a nuclear fuel in that it produces a lot of neutrons in thermal fission, more than the other, more than the other two isotopes. And so it represents the beginning of a sustainable energy source through thorium. Uh, uranium-233 also has some undesirable characteristics, though, from a weapons-making perspective, which is why uranium-233 generated from thorium was not pursued during the Manhattan Project. And Research into thorium was a tiny fraction of the research into uranium enrichment and plutonium production during the Manhattan Project. If you're not going to touch on uh, Seaborg student and the four zillion dollar blah blah blah, then do it now. Nah, use protospace for that. Okay. That was one where I actually told the story better. Protospace. Okay. Oh, I've got to just walk around just a little bit here, Gordon. Sure. Did you guys want to uh, consider going for lunch? I mean, oh, I, I definitely want to consider going for lunch. <laughs> Do you guys want to? I think it'll we, energize we Kirk more. Rosie's a rush hour right now. If we can what time is it right now? It's 12.15. Oh, no, they're already on the down tick now. Well, that's what I was to say. If we can go for about another 20 minutes, we'll have it all to ourselves. Then we, when we get now, we'll, we'll if we, Kirk, if we want right now, we'll be fine. Okay. Let's get one more thingy in and we'll just go. The natural nuclear fuels, uranium and thorium, are both relatively common in the crust of the Earth. Uh, this chart shows the logarithmic distributions of the different elements in the Earth's crust, oxygen being the most common, and then silicon and aluminum and some of the other metals. 
Uranium and thorium are found further down the list in the, in the parts per million. Ura uranium at two and a half parts per million and thorium at 10 parts per million. So to highlight the significance of thorium relative to uranium, you, you might at this point say, well, it's about four times more common. But the story is actually a bit more compelling than that because right now we only use a small fraction of the energy content of uranium. Particularly, we only use the uranium-235 content. Uranium-235 is less than 1% of natural uranium. So if we were to call out uranium-235 all by itself on the same chart as if it were its own element, we would see that it's its abundance is down in the fractions of the parts per million. It's down there at the same levels of abundance as platinum or gold, where we expend tremendous amounts of effort to extract platinum and gold from the crust of the earth. So it gives a sense that we really are exploiting an energy source that's just about as rare as platinum uh, to power our civilization through the use of, of nuclear power. If we were to exploit all of the energy in uranium through a fast breeder, we would be doing much better. But if we were to exploit the energies of thorium in a liquid fluoride thorium reactor, we would be doing far better still. And that's why thorium has the potential to be a much more sustainable energy source than any of the other nuclear fuels. Excellent. Okay. We might want to throw the slides in about the cubic meter of dirt and so forth. We can do that later, but, but that might be a good... We put that together to be a more visual way to understand that than looking at a chart like that. Sure. Okay, can someone clap there? Actually, Kirk, you be the, the three-hand clapper. Okay. Shutting them all down.